Welcome to my video about washer staining guns with gradient penalty and attention levels. All three of these elements are designed to improve the performance of guns and overcome some inherent limitations of their design. Please note that I assume prior knowledge of PyTorch and of the general idea of basic guns. All of the resources I used to learn the subject and create this video are linked to in the video description. To begin with, let's refresh, and this is a refreshment only, on the general architecture of guns. A noise vector is randomly generated and fed into a generator that turns it into an image. Both the generated images and real ones are fed into a discriminator that tells them apart with cross entropy loss. By competing, the generator and discriminator help each other improve. There are three main issues with those vanilla guns. The first one is unstable training. This can happen if the discriminator gets too good at its job too quickly and the generator can't keep up. When this happens, the generator no longer receives meaningful information on how to improve from the discriminator. To me, it feels a bit like a chess beginner that plays with a grandmaster that leaves him no room to improve and learn from his mistakes. Another issue that can arise is mode collapse. This occurs when the generator stumbles upon an output that completely fools the discriminator, and the generator starts to output this only specific image regardless of the input noise. The third and last issue is that cross entropy loss is not very informational for us to keep track on the improvement of the image quality. This happens because the levels of both the discriminator and the generator can fluctuate dramatically. These issues are all addressed by the washer stain distance that is used as a loss function. We will now build our understanding of it step by step. Step 1. Joint distributions are transport plans. Another name for the washer stain distance is the earth mover distance. And the reason for it is that a probability distribution can be thought of as the distribution of sand in a playground. The areas with higher probability densities are places where the sand, sand stacks up higher. So let's say that the sand is distributed to match the red X distribution and we want to move the sand around so it will match the blue Y distribution. For that, we need a transport plan that will tell us how much sand to take from each area of X and where to put it to create the right high density areas for Y, the blue distribution. Here is one optional transport plan. There are many others. Each cell tells us how much to take from a point in X and put in a point of Y. The reason this works as a transport plan is that all the sand has been accounted for. Each row collects all of the sand needed for a point in Y and each column sums up to all of the sand that was in a point of X. Of course, what we are actually looking at is a joint distribution of X and Y, but there are other possible ones. Given this information, we can now understand that the formula for the washer stain distance is looking like this. I've written some helpful notations if you want to pause and have a look. Now, the way I would read this math expression in words is the washer stain distance between the probability distribution of real images and the generated images is given by the joint distribution in which the average sand carrying move is the lowest. You can intuitively interpret infimum as minimum. The problem is that this distance is intractable. Luckily, there is in an alternative equivalent expression which is easier to approximate. It says that the washer stain distance is the highest difference on average 
of any function between real and generated inputs, as long as this function is a one Lipschitz function. A one Lipschitz function is a function, function that for any two inputs and some distance function, the inputs are no less further apart than the outputs. Practically, it limits the function slope to one at most all along its trajectory. Now, let's look at how the loss itself is defined for both the generator and discriminator. For the discriminator, we aim to take the difference between the score of the real images and the fake images on average and update the weights so that this difference gets higher. There are two ways the discriminator can achieve this goal either by making the score of the real images higher or the score of the generated images lower. The objective of the generator is the opposite, producing fake images that will result in the highest possible score. The way to implement this in PyTorch is very simple. We just take the average over the product of the real labels and the predicted labels. The reason this works is the way we assign labels. For the discriminator, Training, real images are labeled 1 and fake images are labeled minus 1. When the generator is training, we switch this and assign a label of 1 to the generated images. I mentioned before that the function that the discriminator approximates has to be a one Lipschitz function for the whole business to work properly. How do we enforce that? The original Wasserstein gun paper did it using weight clipping, but it turns out that there is a much better way of doing so, gradient penalty. The idea is to add a term to the loss that encourages the network to have a discriminator gradient norm of 1. This works because mathematically, if the norm is 1 almost everywhere, the function is 1 Lipschitz. Well, first we need to define the image that the gradient of which we will take the norm of, will be derived with respect to. It turns out that a good input for this purpose is a linear combination of real and fake images. So, how do we implement this? First, we sample noise and create some fake images. Then we randomly sample a vector, alpha, that will determine the, ba the balance between real and fake images for each such merged new image. Using broadcasting, Google it if you are unfamiliar, we combine the real images and the fake ones according to alpha. We turn, the gra we turn on the gradient and get the discriminator predictions. Afterwards, it's time to actually calculate the gradient. It's norm and the norm's distance from one. We use the function autograd.grad to get the gradient of the outputs, the predictions, with respect to the inputs, the merged images. If you are interested in understanding the rest of the arguments, check out the links here. They are also in the description. All that's left to do is to reshape the gradient into a vector, take its norm, and uh, find its distance from one. This distance will be added to the loss in the network. And that's it. Using this knowledge, you can convert your vanilla gun into Wasserstein guns with gradient penalty. You should see dramatic increase in stability and convergence speed. If you want to know more on the theory and about how exactly Wasserstein loss helps solve the issues I described in the beginning of the video, check out all of the great resources I linked to in the description. Now, Generating images requires understanding of connections between different parts of the output. For example, that all parts of the air needs to be same color, or that the eyes must have the same shape and size. This resembles strongly the issue of a sentence, where the last word might be strongly connected to the first one. And just like those NLP models, you can gain much improvement from using the concept of attention. This allows the model to attend to specific parts of the output. In the image, we can see how an attention layer can decide how a word should attend to other words in the sentence. So, how to build this kind of layer for a vision task? 
Well, first we use one-on-one -on -one convolutions to, to convert the input feature map into three separate sets of feature maps called Q, K, and V, query, key, and value, respectively, as is common in the literature. Metrics multiplying the query metrics with the key metrics and applying softmax creates weights that are used to take the linear combination of the value feature maps. The results goes through a final convolver and outputted. In practice, the first step is to put the input to the layer through a separate convolutional layer that will come to play later on. Regardless, the input goes through three separate convolution layers to calculate the query key and value feature maps. You can check the function in the repository in the description, but for now it's enough to understand that the height and width dimensions are combined into a single vector to match the attention calculations. Metrics multiplying the query and key feature maps and applying softmax creates the linear coefficients for the value feature maps. Then, metrics multiplying with their value feature maps and reshaping back to separate the height and width will finally get us the result that goes through a final conflare. Then, met uh, oh yeah, lastly, <laughs> it is multiplied with sigma, a trainable scalar that is initially set to zero. This way, the network can gradually combine the information from the attention layer and take as much from it as it wants. The output is added to the, the initial output from before. This is helpful because the gradient has a highway back to the beginning of the layer, preventing the vanishing gradient problem. Here are some results from my model. Fully trained, you can see some random sampled results, uh, and which you can, as you can see, some are better than others. Also, a set of cherry-picked results that I thought are particularly visually appealing. Anyway, thanks for listening. If you want to be notified next time I'm uploading a project video, feel free to subscribe. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.